All right. Well, I'm going to say good evening. Normally, our, a lot of our YouTube live events are in the afternoon, at least for me, local time CE in the East Coast. But it is now 8 p.m. on the East Coast, the United States. And welcome to our evening YouTube live event. And I wanted to welcome everyone for being here. For those that or at your first YouTube live event or our first Vectoral event. Welcome. My name is Garrett Pachtinger. I'm a board certified critical care specialist and the co-founder of Vectoral. Super excited to have Dr. Cherna here with us today talking about the case-based approach to that season cat. You know how we do it if you've been here before. Now, granted, normally I say I look out because it's noon and it's sunny Pennsylvania. It's dark, cold, winter Pennsylvania. That's where I'm logging in from right now. Dr. Cherna, where are you logging in from? It's actually 6 p.m. here, and I am uh, logging in from very snowy Colorado. Snowy. And I, I can't complain. We had, like, flurries today. And, you know, listen, my, my five-year-old got a little excited about the flurries for a snowy year, but nothing like you have. I, I'm waiting yeah. for that first big, big snow. Yeah. Year, but uh, super snow excited. Too. And uh, for those of you that are logging on with us, please go ahead, type in. I love seeing where you are logging in from. I told Dr. Cherna to expect our global community to step up and be here with us tonight. So if you can type in where you are logging in from, I'd love to read out a couple and see where, see where you all are right now. But as we get forward, uh, as you're doing that, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about people asking about CE. Let's get into that, right? So first of all, thank you so much to Merck Animal Health. They're an amazing educational partner with Becquerel. And as many of you do know that whenever we have an amazing educational partner like Merck, Merck, we are super happy to provide completely free race approved CE to the veterinary community, the veterinary world. With that said, how do you get your CE? So two things, two ways you can do it. You can use your fancy smartphone and use that QR, QR code, excuse me, camera feature, or type into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash, and then VG, which stands for Vectoral, VG, and then today's date, 11-28-23. That will take you to a form to fill out. You could do it now, or we're going to leave that open until 9 p.m. Eastern, so about 30 minutes after the session is over to give you time to do that. I'll show this later on at the end of the session. So again, please either use that QR code or type in tinyurl.com forward slash VG and then today's date, 11 23 And as I promised Dr. Cherna, let's see, we have New Hampshire, North Carolina, uh, Minnesota, uh, Florida, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Pittsburgh, all over the place, all, all over. Ah, yes, Merck, our Merck reps are fantastic. Thank you for pointing that out. So please go ahead and make sure we get our CE. Now, YouTube, you guys know that it is maybe small on your screen, but you can make YouTube that full size of your screen using that bottom right button that I have that arrow to right now. And if this is your first Vectoral event or you're not yet a member, we hope you're taking real great advantage of everything we offer. We have now 11 certificate programs that are out there. These are completely free and part of your Vectoral membership. It's a great way to become more proficient in that area that you love. So check out our certificates. If you're not a Becquerel member, you can get a trial membership, which gives you 14-day access to view anything on our site. So please go ahead and take advantage of that trial membership, and we hope to see you in New Orleans. It is filling up fast, both attendees and exhibitors. Early bird pricing ends January 1st, so if you're thinking about, hmm, where do I want to do CE next year? Do I want to hang out in New Orleans, beignets, jazz, amazing CE? I encourage you to look into this early because I guarantee you we're going to sell out and I don't want you to have FOMO. With that said, I know we're not here to listen to me tonight. Dr. Cherner, we are here to listen to you. So if you can give our audience, we know where you are technically, but what do you love to do? What's your background? Give us a little bit of your story and then please take it away. The floor is now yours. And again, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me and actually being here. I always appreciate pe people wanting to learn more about cats, especially at this time uh, of the day. So I am Dr. Cherna. I am actually originally from Czech Republic in Europe. I have worked for about two years in Scotland before moving to Colorado State uh, to do my internal medicine residency. And I, as my boss, Dr. Lappin, usually says, I'm a crazy cat lady that's not that crazy, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure how right he's about that because I 
definitely feel like I'm trying to be the ultimate level of a crazy cat lady. And uh, I am very, very excited to talk to you today about the approach to the sneezing, uh, the approach to the sneezing cat. So let's uh, move on with some of my slides and let's talk a little bit about general the clinical signs in our uh, in our upper respiratory cats right so i i called it approach to the sneezing cat but it's not just the sneezing that we can see in these in these cats and this can be very frustrating i think sometimes because a lot of these cats especially these like chronic uh, nasal discharge or chronic sneezing cats they can be very very frustrating when we are in practice and having to deal with them so what are we seeing mainly in these kitties so we can see some nasal discharge and i always like to ask owners a lot of questions because i think knowing what type of discharge it is can really help us move on towards more kind of our differentials is this are we dealing more with like a viral bacterial potentially fungal disease or potentially a neoplastic disease and so on so always asking what type of color the discharge is is it serous then usually we would be dealing with some viral infection in those cats such as herpes virus and um, most commonly calici virus as well if it's mucoporulent then those bacterial infections will come and play a little bit bigger role as well such as mycoplasma and chlamydia and we are going to talk a lot more about the infectious um, pathogens later on if i'm seeing epistaxis in these kitties very often we would be dealing with fungal or potentially also neoplastic disease and that's where the signalment and also the location where the patient has been uh, comes in as well and i know when it comes to fungal diseases we very often think about uh, cryptococcosis the most but uh, we've recently actually had increasing number of cats with aspergillosis as well they weren't even brachycephalic so definitely putting fungal diseases on our differentials even in kitties and then importantly we always want to know if it's bilateral or unilateral right because with our bilateral discharge we are more thinking about those infectious agents or potentially inflammatory conditions like chronic rhinitis but then if we actually have very severe unilateral discharge those are the times where i'm thinking maybe more this could be like a foreign body or some neoplasia as well and then what else can we actually see in these kitties so we can have some stertor ocular discharge sometimes when it's a neoplastic process we can have weight loss decreased appetite in these kitties sometimes they can have dysphagia and halitosis as well and i always 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 want to make sure that we also and we'll talk about this now on the next slide that we are also really doing a good dental exam in these cats because the countless times i've unfortunately seen cats either with severe dental disease or post-dental disease that actually develop like tooth root abscesses or fistulas uh, with unilateral mainly nasal discharge has been quite a lot so we really really uh, want to make sure we have a good uh, dental uh, exam on these kitties as well so let's just move on to the next slide here and like i mentioned our viral and infectious and bacterial and fungal diseases We've already mentioned most of those. Uh, bacterial, mainly we would be seeing mycoplasma and chlamydia in these cats, but we can also see sometimes bordetella as well. And we all have seen those uh, chronic respiratory cats with uh, herpes, herpes virus or calici virus. And like I already mentioned, those fungal diseases as well. Chronic rhinitis is unfortunately probably the most frustrating disease we can see in these cats because it can be very challenging to treat and for us really really difficult to help those cats and get those clinical signs away so when i'm actually diagnosing cats with chronic rhinitis it's the type of the disease where you know you expect on because it's usually a diagnosis of exclusion so you always expect owners to spend a couple thousand dollars on your ct rhinoscopies and everything and then you are well we didn't find anything and now i'm not sure how much we can do for your cat so those can be definitely very challenging cases to to deal with neoplastic diseases such as lymphoma or carcinoma would be the most common one in the nasal cavity in a cat and you know those every time i say tell the owners oh my god like we diagnosed your cat has a nasal mass very likely we're dealing with like a lymphoma or carcinoma in your kitty 
and people panic, right? And people freak out. But usually if they can afford radiation therapy, for example, there is a very good chance that these cats will actually die of something else and not their nasal tumors. So the prognosis for these cats with appropriate therapy can definitely be great. And we're going to chat about this a little bit uh, later through my lecture as well. Foreign bodies are seeing less common in cats than they are in dogs, but we definitely see some. And uh, very often those are usually outdoor, uh, outdoor cats or at least with an outdoor access. And we see mainly like those grass seeds, for example. And usually this happens, of course, throughout um, kind of spring, summer rather than winter months. But depends, of course, where you are located and everything. But uh, foreign bodies less common in cats, but definitely can happen. What we see very often in these kitties, it would be nasopharyngeal polyps or stenosis. So polyps we would usually see in younger kitties. And uh, we've had chronic kind of even rhinitis cases that can lead to nasopharyngeal stenosis from the inflammation. And then we have to, for example, uh, balloon dose and uh, kind of deal with those as well. And like I already mentioned, the toothed abscesses and fistulas can be quite uh, common in these cats, especially older kitties with dental disease or cats that have just undergone a dental uh, procedure or especially uh, dental removals, for example. For our diagnostics, so we always want to do our kind of uh, basic uh, workup, right? So blood work and urine analysis. And um, for, you know, we want to look if there's any changes on their CBCs. However, I've had septic cats even that have completely normal CBC. So a lot of these cats can be, have pretty boring uh, or unremarkable uh, findings on our hematology or even serum chemistry. I always like to have my FIV, FIV status in all the patients I see because, of course, they can be more prone to secondary infections. They can be more prone, those kids can be more prone to, for example, even lymphomas or other types of cancer. So we always want to know their FIV or retroviral status. Fungal serology can be quite helpful if you are suspicious for potentially uh, cryptococcosis, so then we can do the um, uh, latex agglutination test. For aspergillosis, we can do our agit testing as well, so those can be uh, quite helpful as well. And diagnostic imaging, when we are looking into a little bit more kind of advanced workups in those cats, Radiographs can be quite limiting in these kitties because we, of course, have a lot of the soft tissue and bones and everything. There is a lot of stuff happening in your nose and uh, radiographs might not be the best uh, kind of diagnostic modality. So computed uh, tomography or CT scan would be very helpful for these cats. We do rhinoscopies a lot. And we can, of course, do our rigid rhinoscopy where we approach from the nose. And I love our flexible uh, scopes for these cats because I really always want to check and look into their nasopharynx because sometimes we can see, you know, foreign bodies, those polyps, their masses and everything. So always, even if CT is pretty unremarkable, I always want to check their nasopharynx as well. And then, you know, we don't, we can, if we take our biopsies, we want to consider some histopathology, mainly fungal cultures, bacterial cultures. We do not do that uh, much in the nasal cavity because there are a lot of co so-called commensal pathogens or pathogens that are just completely normal uh, to the nasal cavity. And then for our herpes, calici, chlamydia, and uh, so on, for our infectious disease testing, we can always consider doing our PCR or polymerase chain reaction testing. But I would just want to like to point out that this can be sometimes limiting in patients because we can have healthy patients actually testing positive and it not might be the cause of their clinical signs. Or we can also have, of course, false negative uh, PCRs as well. So let's talk about the case I have seen uh, recently. So this was Russia, actually. And he was a 10 year old uh, male castrated Persian cat, a brachycephalic cat. And I know there's a lot of discussion about brachycephalic cats lately. The one picture where you actually see the fluorescent stain, that's my personal cat. That's the love of my life. She's my exotic short hair. And uh, so I actually have a special love and place in my heart for brachycephalic kitties. 
even though, of course, we are trying to do our very best to breed them as healthy as possible. But Russia came to us for two year history of nasal discharge, which was worsening in about the past uh, past month and also started to actually become uh, hyperexic to even progressing to anorexia. So owners brought him in and our physical exam, he had uh, bilateral mucopril and nasal discharge but also bilateral serostim mucopril and ocular discharge. So when we see the nasal and ocular discharge and you can see he has some conjunctivitis, he also had positive fluorescent stain and unfortunately don't have a picture of him. So I put in my own cat because we are dealing with herpes with her all the time. So uh, I've put that picture, but you can see this cat very likely probably has some uh, infectious disease component uh, uh, playing a role, right? We see that uh, those um, uh, eyes are really red. He's really struggling to open them. And if you imagine, you know, brachycephalic cats, they struggle usually a little bit sometimes to breathe. And if you imagine you have a terrible mucopril and discharge, and this is not just brachycephalic cats, but we see that a lot in um, normal dolichocephalic or domestic short hair cats, they can really struggle if they have nasal discharge and they're congested, they do not smell the food. So very often in these cats, actually, the, the, the loss of smell can lead to potentially them uh, also losing interest in food. So let's see what we did with Raja on the next slide. So on our differentials, we of course had feline herpes virus because we had uh, we had an ulcer in his eye. We couldn't completely rule out feline calice virus either. And then bacterial causes, yes, we of course would be considered mainly for mycoplasma and chlamydia in these cases. But we also want to make sure that when we are doing those bacterial cultures, as I mentioned, that there are some bacteria that are completely normal for cats to have. And cryptococcosis and aspergillosis would be also on our differential list, especially aspergillosis, right? Because he is a brachycephalic cat. And um, compared to dogs, and you know, cats just, they don't want to be like dogs ever. So aspergillosis, and we see in those dolichocephalic dogs, like German Shepherd dogs, but our, it is our brachycephalic cats, but they, they will actually have aspergillosis. So what about testing and what we, what we want to do for these kitties, right? So for the herpes virus and Khaleesi virus, especially for herpes virus, we actually have some uh, therapy that we could potentially do. So usually using from cyclovir at about 90 milligrams per kilogram up to three times a day is usually helpful. However, I think at this point sometimes we always need to balance what is because you know herpes virus cats have latent infections and it can they can um, start shedding and be sick again when we stress them out so some cats i have personal cat that has uh, suffers from herpes virus and for me doing spilling her three times a day with some cyclover can be quite challenging so if it's just um, ocular signs and they have those ulcers then potentially sidofever topically can be a very good options for those cats but the three times a day pilling a cat with some cyclover we always want to make sure that those cats can be tolerating that as well because if owners have to chase them around the house the cats are stressed getting the medication maybe it's not going to help um, as much so then uh, for uh, Khaleesi virus unfortunately we only can help with um, supportive therapy, right? So very often when we actually see Khaleesi virus in those cats and they have a linguinal or oral ulcerations, those cats, again, really do not want to be eating because they are very painful. So some pain medications, for example, for those cats uh, would, be, would be helpful. And then just to point out, if we see those like dendritic ulcers in cats, we always want to have uh, herpes virus on our differential. Okay, let's move on. This was actually an interesting, uh, just couple interesting studies looking into uh, using a fun cyclover in cats for herpes virus. So, you know, we still recommend it because we know it potentially can help with those clinical signs, but we just always wanna, when it comes to cats, we always want to balance, you know, what will help them more than hurt them actually. And this was an interesting study actually done by um, my uh, boss, Dr. Lapin here, but it's not why I'm presenting the study, 
but actually I've used it in some of my patients. And, you know, intranasal vaccines uh, actually seem to be helping in cats that have those clinical signs as well, because we have really good mucosal immunity in those cats. So we've had a couple of patients where we administer those intranasal uh, vaccines. And these, we are quite lucky here in the U.S. because unfortunately these intranasal vaccines are very limited um, in Europe and other places, but we have them. Uh, pretty well available throughout the um, United States. So I would usually recommend that uh, if you have cats that have those pretty bad recurrent clinical signs, those intranasal vaccines can help because they have really good uh, mucosal immunity for those cats. Uh, for the bacterial infections, uh, those can be a little bit easier to treat, I would say, because usually we would use um, one of my favorite antibiotics in cats, which is doxycycline. But we, of course, have to be very careful because we do not want to use doxycycline in tablets, uh, right? Because it can cause uh, esophageal strictures and can cause a lot of issues to those cats. So we really want to make sure we can compound it into a liquid medication. You can either do it five milligram per kilogram twice a day. I usually do that in dogs because dogs seem to have a little bit more GI side effects from the doxycycline. Cats seem to tolerate it pretty well and do not really have many side effects from doxycycline. And I prefer that it sit, we don't have to, one, pill them or give them the liquid or give them medication twice. And two, it doesn't sit in their esophagus twice uh, throughout the day. So I usually would choose once a day. If I have, because Pradofloxacin will also work for our mycoplasma. So if I have some cats potentially that did not respond to doxycycline, have a lot of other comorbidities, then potentially Pradofloxacin uh, could uh, be used for these cats as well. But it is, uh, compared to doxycycline, which is, it, of course, uh, less uh, concern for uh, antimicrobial resistance, I only would use Pradofloxacin in those cats that have comorbidities, have not responded um, to other medications and so on. It's not my first choice to go to. And then let's just move to this other slide, which is very interesting on ISCAID guidelines. So it's the International Society for um, kind of uh, company and animal infectious diseases. Uh, I'm a member. I love the organization. I love the group uh, because we always, um, you know, try to come up with new uh, uh, infectious disease guidelines. And this was actually a great uh, this was a great guideline that came up in 2017. And you guys can all access this. Uh, you guys can have this access this completely freely online. But on my next slide now, I'm going to just show you uh, that this is a table that is recommended. And this is from, this is not something I, you know, just am recommending because I think this is what we should do. This is actually the panels of the, um, of the experts uh, that have came up with uh, these guidelines. And so usually most cats with these upper respiratory tract infections will self-resolve and completely get fine within about seven to 10 days without any antimicrobial therapy. However, if we have cats that have fever, are lethargic, not eating, and have also mucopril and nasal discharge, then we can potentially use antimicrobials within those 10 days. If we have more kind of, um, chronic clinical signs that are lingering for over 10 days and then we really want to do a little bit more diagnostic workup and potentially we are suspected in a bacterial infection then we should consider doing antibiotics and there is a great table i just put these two up there because we usually would be recommending either doxycycline and or amoxicillin and not even amoxicillin clavulanate really just amoxicillin or doxycycline as the first line therapy for these uh, upper respiratory um, cases in cats. Or of course, if you have a culture with susceptibility, then we can use those um, to guide us what antimicrobials to use. But I strongly recommend, there are also guidelines on dogs, and uh, I really recommend that you guys access those even if you have time. All right, so what we did with Russia, we actually did CT rhinoscopy, which came back as a lymphoplasmocytic rhinitis. And we placed also a feeding tube in Russia because I think those cats are not eating. You know, we are already putting them under anesthesia. So I'm always way more proactive when cats are not eating. And, you know, if, they, if I place that e-tube in and they start eating in one or two days, then great. 
we can it takes two seconds to take it out but i think you know really being proactive and giving those patients the support they need and we all know what problems can we can get in cats that are not eating like hepatic lipidosis and so on so we really want to provide cats nutrition it's always the number one thing we worry about in cats when they do not eat so we place the seat uh, we place the feeding tube and we started him on Doxycycline once a well, uh, once a day, because he had those ulcer, ulcers in his eyes. We were also doing lubrication and sidofever in his eyes, and um, we were concerned for potentially secondary also uh, bacterial infection in his eyes. So also topically, we did some erythromycin for him, and then uh, of course started him on some mirtazapine as well. And uh, you can see this is a picture actually of Russia afterwards. And you can see how from that really, really uh, dirty face kitty, he turned into this beautiful color pointed person and has been doing really well since. So I actually just recently diagnosed him three years later with actually small cell GI lymphoma. So now we started him on steroids as well. But in terms of his respiratory disease, he's been doing really well so after that episode. So um let's now talk a little bit just about vaccinations as well because i think those are really important and i know we might be like running a little bit out of time so i will not bore you with all these guidelines but on my next slide now i'm gonna just uh, show you what we usually recommend so these are vaccination guidelines and i hope i'm not boring you with all these guidelines but i really love when a lot of smart people uh, come into you know one room and come out with some recommendations for our for our uh, everyday practice so these guidelines these are now we are now talking about household pets and these guidelines actually split different cats into different groups because some cats, of course, will be at high risk of infections, right? So if you are dealing with the one cat that's an indoor only single cat household cat, it's probably less likely going to get, um, you know, uh, herpes virus reinfections and chlamydia and mycoplasma. Then when you, I have a six cats at home and then, you know, there are shelters that will have, uh, of course, a lot of cats in, in the same room and everything. So those are then much more likely to have um, uh, multiple, of course, issues with infectious diseases. But just so you know, we usually recommend, and it depends uh, what type of vaccines you are using. So we usually do not recommend vaccinating earlier than six weeks when you are using the one that has panleukopenia in it as well, right? Because those cats um, can develop potentially concern, there's concern for them developing cerebral hypoplasia. So we do not want to vaccinate uh, either pregnant queens or kittens with attenuated live vaccines uh, when they're less than four weeks old. And then please just note that we really are trying to these days to vaccinate uh, last time when they are about 16 to 20 weeks of age, because that's when kind of their maternal antibodies wane. So it is actually very useful that those cats get one more vaccine when they're about four to five months of age, just to kind of help them really have a good uh, protection from the vaccination, because sometimes the vaccines can really be fighting with their uh, maternal antibodies. And then you can see those intranasal vaccines potentially uh, can actually be used even earlier if they do not contain the panleukopenia vaccine. And there are some on the market for that as well. Let's move on. So this was just a study that was done. And you can see, again, I don't want to bore you too, in too much detail, but you can see it was just a study done where actually some of these cats uh, can have maternal antibodies up to 12 weeks of age. So that's why we try to push the maybe even a third vaccine at around the 18 to 20 weeks. All right. And then just, um, I will probably skip this slide just for the sake of time. And these are just kind of uh, guidelines and you will probably have access of these as well, just to different types of vaccines, you know, for rabies vaccination as well. But then on the next slide, we are gonna just see here is actually how we recommend vaccinating those cats that are in a shelter population or at a little bit higher risk, of course, for developing infections. And you can see sometimes even vaccinating like every two weeks until they are 
like four to eight, four, um, four to five months of age, just to help them to really, again, have that good kind of protection. And especially in those shelter cats, right? Those intranasal vaccines for herpes and calice potentially could be very helpful because we could actually use them uh, pretty early. If they do not have the panleukopenia in them, we really could be using them for those kitties pretty fast uh, when they are still young. Okay. So I'll have you look at these guidelines a little bit more after my lecture as well, if you want to, and um, maybe just move on. There's also the non-core vaccines. So those, you know, for herpes virus, chlamydia, uh, sorry, herpes virus, calice virus, and panleukopenia, those we call our core vaccines. And for our uh, chlamydia vaccines, those are the non-core. So usually we would only vaccinate cats that are at quite high risk of infection. And before I finish completely, I just wanted to show you guys this case, uh, which was a patient I've seen um, actually quite a while ago. It was Tessa. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yes, so it was Tess. She was a 16-year-old female spit domestic long hair that came for two-year history of sneezing. But when she presented to me, she actually had pretty severe right-sided epistaxis, but also mucopolar nasal discharge from her left nostril. She had exophthalmus, an elevated third eyelid. She had quite a lot of resistance and retropulsion. So always with these upper respiratory kitties, I try to always uh, do a good physical exam and palpation of their face to really try to see any asymmetry in the face, potentially some pain on their bone or dental and so on. And then uh, she had also decreased nasal airflow bilaterally. So on the next slide now, I'm gonna show you what we did. So we, of course, it was an older kitty. I always check blood pressure in my all my cats. She was quite anemic, but it was normocytic non-regenerative anemia. Could be from her epistaxis, epistaxis, but she also had a lot of comorbidities and it was a non-regenerative anemia. We've done just radiographs and she has no signs of metastatic disease. So we have actually uh, moved uh, to do a CT scan where we noticed she had a nasal mass and we've taken a biopsy and unfortunately I was very upset because this can happen even cats that have really severe um, nasal masses that we can see, we take a biopsy and sometimes we just don't get in good enough sample and it came back as a proliferative rhinitis but we were pretty certain that she actually had nasal tumor. So we did the radiation therapy because here you can see uh, that she had pretty aggressive nasal mass. It went all the way to her nasopharynx as well. And she had some cribriform plate lysis and enlarged lymph nodes. So we actually treated her with radiation therapy. And like I said at the beginning, most of these cats will actually live for months to years and die usually of something else with radiation therapy alone without any chemotherapy. So these cats tend to do really, really well. And this was actually what happened with Tess. And I think on my next slide, I have a picture of her. So she underwent stereotactic radiation therapy. So she had three fractions of 30, completely uh, three fractions of 10 grays. And look at her she actually had this funny because sometimes they can lose some uh, of her, their hair and then they can change the color of their hair as well uh, so she developed some of the side effects but look at her how happy she is and she's actually i think two years out now from her radiation therapy and she's struggling with the kidney disease but otherwise has been doing really well in terms of her nasal mass Wonderful. So let's uh, just want to thank you all. I'm sorry for running a minute or two over time. So I hope I wasn't boring you too much. But I always feel like there's so much to tell about upper respiratory disease in cats. And I think there's my email. So if anybody has a challenging case or need any help with their um, upper respiratory kitties, I'm always happy to help. Well, Dr. Cherna, thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, we all know that uh... The sneezing kitty can certainly be a conundrum, can be frustrating for families, can sometimes be frustrating for us as well. So that was an awesome uh, uh, review and discussion on these really, really common cases. Before I move any forward, uh, any further, a couple of things. One is, again, thank you so much to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring this event. This is live. We are live right now. It is interactive. Please ask questions. And it is CE, race CE approved. So I'm going to go ahead and put up 
Um, for those that may have missed in the beginning, I know Justine and I have posted it in the comments as well. There are two ways to get your CE certificate for tonight's event. One is you can use your fancy smartphone and look at the QR code and then open up that form. And or you can type into your website browser tinyurl.com forward slash VG, which stands for Vectoral, VG, and then today's date, 11 23 Importantly, please make sure the email that you use when you fill out this form is the email address associated with your vet girl online account. What happens is we match up that account with you being in attendance and usually within 12 hours, if not an hour or two, it, uh, sometimes it, it really, really fast, the CE certificate will be found in your My Credits account on our site. Um, um, about a year ago, we stopped emailing this out after the fact, so it goes directly in your account for safekeeping. That's the way you always know where it is, and you never have to worry about losing it or finding it again. So if you filled out the form and you accidentally did not use that email address, no problem. Just fill out the form again. It's not a problem. Fill out the form again, and please put in the correct email associated with your Vecural account. With that said, again, this is interactive, so I'd love to get uh, Dr. Cherna a question or two that you may have, so please go ahead and type that in. I'm going to look for a couple. Uh, this came up more than once. So, Dr. Cherna, you talked about how doxycycline is one of your favorite antibiotics for these kitties. Now, we all know that uh, um, based on their size, normally, for most of us, the normal tablet sizes that are available may be too large. So what are you doing? Are you, are you fractioning them, cutting them? Are you compounding liquid? What's your favorite route to get them doxycycline um, uh, to make it effective? Yeah, I have never, and you know, I've not been practicing for that long, but I'm very proud to say I have never ever used a doxycycline tablet in a cat and I go crazy when I see people doing it because I've had a couple of my colleagues that, you know, we have a compounding pharmacy at CSU, but it's sometimes hard to get compounded doxycycline over the weekend. So we've had cases where we just prescribe tablets for the weekend and then their owners picked up compounded liquid doxycycline uh, and that's why we want to do liquid is because it doesn't sit actually in the bottom of your kind of at your alley um, lower esophageal sphincter causing because it's very kind of acidic so that's why it's causing these strictures so we really don't want those capsules even crushed or anything pills just sit there so we want to try to use really compounded into liquid and sadly even for two days with capsules or pill tablets of doxycycline we've had cats developing esophageal strictures so there was a study done some years ago where they actually watched cats just swallow kittens actually swallow uh, empty capsules and they watch them on how long they sit there and they can sit at the les for hours sometimes so we really don't want to do that so always doxycycline and uh, compound it into liquid please yeah i always joke with people um yeah. if you ever want to see some gross stuff Google yeah. doxycycline side effects and people yeah. know a lot of them. There's some light effects, photophobia and other things to your skin. Yeah. Um, but, but I, like you, I always dogs and cats, just the same. I always tell people uh, if you're giving doxycycline and it's a once a day thing. I always tell them to try to, if it's once a day, try to give it to them in the morning with food. So they run around. They're not, you know, I, I don't like it when they give it to them right before bed because they swallow it then they lay down and go to sleep and it just sits there. So for all of these reasons, we want to make sure that the doxy we give is safe and effective, right? Above no, uh, no else do no harm. It's like a fascinating medication. It has a lot of immunomodulatory properties as well. So I love it, not just because of its antimicrobial activity, but we really are getting more and more studies showing that it potentially can do something to the cats and dogs immune system and help them out as well. But yeah, always give them, offer them some food afterwards, even with the liquid food. And I love these churro treats. I don't know if you guys know them. I've, my colleagues tell me that I should actually contact the company to fund my feline clinic because the money we spend and I make the yeah. hospital spend on these churro treats because, but you know, it's, cats love it. I think we really underestimate how cats are food motivated. So even giving them like a churro treat after their doxy, it would be great. So Shannon, I think that answered your question because you, Shannon asked, uh, with even with the compounded liquid, you still chase it with medication or food. Yeah. And as you're saying, some type of food, water, treat something that she just see if we can help move that along and get it into the, the stomach and not sit in the esophagus in any way is, is, is the best we can try to do for them. So please go ahead and, and, and type in any questions that you may have. There are a lot of questions about doxycycline and it makes sense. You talked about how you love it and you use it all the time. So 
I think there was one other question. I, that, yeah, I think I saw at the beginning the, asking me how often I use those feeding tubes and because yes, they're yes. not eating. I am always very pro feeding tubes and very aggressively pushing for those to be placed in. So I think it really saves lives in these upper. I'm sorry, one of my cat's tail is in the <laughs> way. A ragdoll oh. kitten. She just like loves being here. So always very, learning. very proactive. Yes, she loves to learn. <laughs> and, so and all, mm -hmm. I guess I'll take it one step further and then we'll yep. end it probably after this question. But, you know, to, to me, when I think of feeding tubes as a, a, a non-surgeon or, you know, not using endoscopy, but as the critical care ER doctor myself, when I think of feeding tubes, they're the two that come to mind are, you know, the nasal, so nasal esophageal or nasal gastric versus your esophageal feeding tube. So what is your guideline on when you're going to place like an N, E, and yeah. G versus a true uh, esophageal feeding tube? Yeah, I hate usually nasogastric or nasoesophageal or whatever naso tubes in cats because cats' nostrils are so tiny. Those congested cats, if you actually stuck yes. a tube in those, it's just going to be even worse. So I always do esophageal uh, feeding tubes. They're so easy to place. I can probably, after these years, I, years I've planned so many, I can place them under five minutes with an endoscopy. So I just think, and I think anybody can learn this. We teach our students to do that, assist with those. So I think it's a life-saving procedure for these cats with almost any disease. I've had one now cat with a chronic kidney disease, stage four. The cat shouldn't have probably lived for the past 12 months and he's still alive and kicking because he has that E-tube in. So I really think those are life-saving things. And always for me, as a fragile feeding tubes for cats, I have played some nasogastric like over the weekend if it was an emergency, we wanted to just buy us some time. But for these congested kitties, uh, the nas um, nasal tubes are just not the best option. Plus then we can't really send them home and which cat wants to be in a hospital, right? So I always want to get them out as soon as possible. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I totally agree. Well, Dr. Yeah. Cherna, again, thank you so much. A lot of great comments, a lot of thank yous, lots of awesome information. And we have our global fun audience with us. So really super cool information. Really, really appreciate it. Remember for the next 19 minutes, looking at my clock now, that form will remain open. Please make sure you fill it out. Please make sure you use the email address associated with your Vet Girl account. Probably by this evening, if not tomorrow morning, the latest in your account, your Vet Girl account, your My Credits page, your CE certificate will be there from tonight's YouTube live event. This will remain on YouTube as well as after the fact on our Vet Girl site. As you guys know, um, all of our Vet Girl content while given live is also placed in our on-demand library so you can learn on your time. Certainly hope you enjoyed this evening. Again, thank you to Merck. Please make sure you sign up for Vet Girl U. New Orleans is going to be super fun, as we know New Orleans often is. And early bird pricing ends on January 1st and starts getting a little more expensive. So take advantage of the discount. As always, thank you all so much for what you do. I know it's challenging. I know we run around in the clinic all day long. We Our lunch is a granola bar if you're lucky. You get home late. You, you know, you're there early. You get home late. It's It's tough. Sometimes you feel underappreciated, but we appreciate you. Thank you for doing all that you do. Thank you for showing up tonight to learn some with us. And with that, we're going to say good night, and hopefully we see you online at our next Vecral event. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.